much for coming uh, this, no, actually it's afternoon, isn't it? It's the, 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 uh, the sun has passed the yard arm or whatever happens around here. I've had a chat with some of you people over there and some over here. I haven't had a chat with you, but perhaps we could have a chat afterwards. Um, this may seem like a specialist interest, designing the underworld, but it's absolutely fundamental. Um, I think when you hear the speakers go through their presentations today, um, I'm sure you will go away convinced that there is no way forward for towns and cities other than the more effective management of the spaces that are below the surfaces of our streets. Um, I'm not going to waffle on because you want to hear the speakers. First of all, let me introduce Gary Grant. He's an independent consultant ecologist with more than 35 years experience of urban nature conservation. His projects have included the London Olympic Park Biodiversity Action Plan, education, an education city in Qatar, and a winning competition entry to convert a 24 kilometer long disused railway to a cycle path in Singapore. So somebody with international experience and he's gonna sell us a vision. Over to you, Gary. Thank you. I will give you a bit of background because I think it's important to set this in context. It is a technical issue, of course, but we, we need to uh, have some kind of shared vision. And I like the idea of green infrastructure being an ecosystem approach. And I also like the idea that green infrastructure solves a lot of these problems that we have in... Uh, in cities which cost us billions so if we can bring more soil vegetation and water into the city then we solve a lot of these problems and it it pays for itself uh, we've also of course got this problem of climate change which is still being ignored by too many people and that means that we have more drought and more extreme weather heavier rainfall and that means that we need to really think about how our underground city will cope, will help us to cope with that. And of course, the other uh, really helpful concept is this idea of ecosystem services. So these are the benefits that we get from nature free of charge, uh, which are, if you like, a side, of, a side effect of uh, bringing more soil and vegetation and water into the city but it's uh, a helpful language and there's a lot of academic research uh, in ecosystem services uh, if you're interested in the detail of that. And the other really important concept is multifunctionality. So we need to make sure that all the interventions that we have work together to bring us the whole range of ecosystem services. So uh, I want to now go into this, this idea of the water-sensitive city so water, the water-sensitive city and water-sensitive urban design is an idea that's come out of Australia which looks at the water cycle in the city. So it's not just about uh, drainage, which of course is very important, but also about reducing the amount of water that we consume, which is extracted from the wider environment. So it's looking at uh, reducing the consumption of potable water, it's about recycling water, uh, and it's about uh, sustainable drainage as well. So uh, I'm just going to look at a few, uh, uh, a few important concepts here. So in the uh, wider environment, uh, you'll find that a lot of the rain that lands infiltrates, and that's typically about half of the rain that lands uh, on the city. And of course, some of it's transpired as well. So that's very important, not what we're talking about today but evapotranspiration is very important. And in the greenfield environment, relatively, uh, a relatively small amount of that water runs off. But in the town, because of the impermeable surfaces, the sealed surfaces, you'll find that the infiltration rates are much reduced uh, and uh, evapotranspiration is reduced uh, and runoff is increased. And that runoff is a real problem because it, it, uh, it means that water is polluted, so it's, it's polluting the downstream, the uh, uh, water courses, but also it's sending water rapidly downstream through pipes and water courses to cause flooding. So we need to rediscover our underground in order to increase that infiltration rate. 
And you know, another way of looking at it is to go from a linear process to a more circular process. And in a, uh, yet another way of looking at this, business as usual means that we have all these sealed surfaces. Uh, we've got rid of uh, too much of our soil. We've sealed things off. We need to mimic nature, of course, if we mimic nature exactly, we don't have a town. So what that means is that we're depaving, and where rivers have been uh, put into pipes, we're bringing them to the surface. The Americans call that daylighting rivers. Uh, we're bringing in green roofs, we're harvesting rainwater. But today, a lot of it is about depaving and the quality of that soil that is exposed. So just rapid, very rapidly, before we look underground, we'll well, bear in mind, of course, that we can put soil on buildings and we can hold a lot of rainfall on buildings. So this is a London Underground train shed, which causes flooding. And so London Underground wanted to use rain, uh, green roofs to hold a certain amount of rainfall. And so they've been measuring that with the University of East London. By the way, it's work that's been done for more than 30 years in Germany, but we, uh, in, in England, people are determined to repeat that research to check it. And of course, we can intercept downpipes, very simple. Uh, and we, as I said before, we can daylight streams or if they've been canalized, you know, that, that's not satisfactory. We can, we can do this, this is in Southeast London. So, okay, underground, people off, will often say, well, if we do depave, then we've still got a problem. It's, it's crowded underground, uh, and people will say, well, actually, uh, it's too difficult. But remember that plants and vegetation and drainage is actually, for the most part, about a very shallow part of the uh, underground. So uh, there's something we can do there. And you'll often hear as well that in places where the geology is impermeable, so for instance, in London, there's a lot of clay, people will often argue, well, there's nothing we can do because it's impermeable. But of course, remember that the natural clay is not the only material. There's a lot of made ground and we can, we can uh, replace soils with free draining soils if we wish. So there's a lot that we can do. Now, trees uh, suffer. So uh, we tend to put a small tree in a small pit and we hope that the tree finds water. And yes, trees do find water. They usually find it in a sewer. So whenever you dig up a sewer, you'll find tree roots have forced their way into the sewer because the underground environment is so harsh. But our, co our colleagues in places in Germany, and this is in Sweden, uh, they will refurbish the soil. So when they are refurbishing a street, they will dig out, uh, they will vacuum the existing soil away, leaving the tree roots, and they will dig out the ground and they will replace it in Sweden with a stony material and they'll wash uh, a, a soil which is suitable for the trees uh, between those layers. Now, these uh, uh, structural soils can take the weight of paving and vehicles. So you have an option. You've created a large permeable void under the pavement. Uh, the services are nicely wrapped up in uh, whatever protective material is required. And so, so that is a sustainable drainage system, if you like, uh, which can store a lot of water. It can infiltrate and clean water. But as I say, you can pave over this. Or you can leave it open and top it up with soil as a planter. So this is uh, uh, what they do in, in Sweden. So you can have a tree that's been stressed. And then when you've refurbished uh, uh, with these technical soils, the tree's recovered within a year. It's recovered. Uh, you're reducing flood risk. And, and so this is something that can easily be done. It's not being done in the UK routinely, but it's something that we need to learn. And of course, there are other ways of doing this. So our American colleagues have these suspended pavements where they're using plastic boxes and free draining yet water absorbent soils, which can take the weight of paving and vehicles, but they give the space for the tree roots to spread. And there are people here supplying these products if you want to know more about the detail. And so the tree is much happier there. It's not seeking uh, to steal water from the sewer 
of course, we can never guarantee that a tree won't do that, but we can make its life underground much happier. Another thing we can do when we depave, we can, uh, we can uh, excavate the soil and replace it with a mixture of sand and uh, uh, composted material as a rain garden. And what's ex interesting about this kind of intervention is that money that, for instance, might be earmarked for something like traffic calming can be used for greening. So we're traffic calming, we're greening, we're, we're increasing uh, the amount of impermeable uh, material to reduce flood risk. And we can do a lot of simple things. We can make cuts in curbs, we can lower beds, we can excavate soil and replace it. So a lot of these are simple principles about getting the levels right. So raised beds don't really work because they're not receiving runoff, but lowering beds, very simple changes. Again, this is a, uh, an urban uh, swale where it's a lowered bed. So even in a very urban area, we can do something with the flood, surface flood waters. And of course, the trees will grow more quickly and a larger tree is providing us more ecosystem services, shade, cooling, intercepting uh, air pollution. And, you know, a lot of this can be a, a whole swarm of very small interventions all over the place, which on their own may not amount to very much, but collectively will start to transform the city. So instead of having a downpipe uh, issuing into a block drain, we can issue into a rain garden. And of course, we unblock the drain so that when the rain garden fills, it can overflow into that. So I hope I've given you a good introduction to some of the issues here. You'll hear more about the details from others. If you want to know more about ecosystem services in the urban environment, you can buy this book from Blackwell. And if you want to know more about the water sensitive city, you can buy uh, the other book, uh, and if you can't afford it, then you should demand that your library stocks it. That's the end of the of the advert. advert. Sorry about that, but uh, we, we all have to make a living. So I'll hand you back to the chairman. Thank you very much, Gary. D did, did you like what you saw? Were they attractive environments? Yes, they were. And why can't we have more of those? We don't know. Perhaps we're, we'll discuss it as the... Um, the the presentations go on. Now, if I could have mine. There we go. This is me, Robert Huxford. I'm director of the Urban Design Group, but I'm also a, a member of the ICE's Municipal Expert Panel, along with John Thompson there. And I'm very pleased to see Roger Venables in the audience. Um, Roger's wife, uh, Jean, was a president of the Institution of Civil Engineers, and I was very pleased to work with her about 20 years ago on a, uh, a brochure called Liquid Assets, which is very much about daylighting buried watercourses. It's a tragedy that these wonderful assets uh, play no part in the quality of life and the quality of the experience that we have of towns and cities. Anyway, here we go. I'm going to focus on problems. Um, so does anybody recognize this? This is the Euston Road. And Euston Station is there. Um, and you'll see that church, church tower there. And this is how it was maybe 150 years ago. And you can see some of the infrastructure here, uh, a gully, a sewer, gas, water, uh, and water pipes there. Now, that's uh, 150 years ago. What happened subsequently is a load of extra stuff has come along. Cable TV, telephone, electricity supplies, district electricity supplies. I mean, that's a gross simplification. If you did a cross section of the Euston Road now, um, it would be a complete morass of well, anyway, um, and maybe there's a, an approach forward, and others will be talking about this later on. Combined utilities, ducts, conduits, and that sort of stuff. Anybody know where this is? Come on, it's a famous London, London spot. You must know. It's Oxford Circus. Why didn't you recognise that? Or how about this? Where's this one? Anybody? Anybody know? Come on, you should be able to recognise the water pipes. and the, um, It's the Strand. Yes. Um, how about this? Come on. No, come on, this is a dead giveaway. It's Edinburgh. I'm almost falling off the stage there. Sorry about that. I'm getting a bit excited about um, pipes and drains. My grandfather was a, a plumber, and um, he used to say, oh, listen here, my boy. Uh, 
Uh, you think you're too big for the drains. I've seen better things than you floating down the drains. Um, anyway, so here you have a, a multi-million uh, urban infrastructure scheme here that went massively over budget because of the utilities. Look at this. Gas pipe and cables that are laid barely four inches below the, the footway service. And you see that. I mean, how does a, a workman cope with that, or indeed a workwoman? It's, it's a ludicrous way of doing things. And you know, if we're going to make use of these spaces, they've got to be organized better than this. Um, Gower Street, London. You see, that just wasn't a one-off. Look at this. Gower Street, it happens all the way down. Um, and the impact. Anybody recognize this part? Come on. Anybody? Quick. Trafalgar Square. And you get a prize, you have won one of the lions. You can collect it later on today. Um, and the, the problem is the streets are filling up with stuff. Um, that one, I mean, how do you get a tree or a, a infiltration into that sort of environment? Um, there's a major problem before uh, any road is opened. You've got people to go in and do surveys and find out or at least predict what's there. Um, this is Cannon Street. Um, in 2000, uh, in, in about um, 1998, there was a highly attractive new street scheme here, but it starts to get opened. And this was a photograph that I took in January. It's been opened on a regular basis. And look what's underneath. Um, and some of these carry millions or indeed billions of pounds worth of financial data. They're essential for the city to operate. Gas, water, power you name it, it's down there. And what a stupid way to organise this. Absolutely barbaric. So, what are the lost opportunities? This, um, a road closure intended to um, improve the environment for people, but uh, a telephone cabinet is in the way. How much does it cost to move one of these? 150,000 quid. That's not going to be moved. That's going to be there potentially for hundreds of years. Um, what about this? The damage to quality street services, a site in Sheffield, that's appalling. Um, blind people, the RNIB have a campaign to raise awareness. What's this got to do with the underground? It's got everything to do with the underworld. Um, and we're talking about a breach of the public sector equality duty here. Um, there is a duty on all public authorities to consider, uh, have due regard to the need to eliminate discrimination. This woman is being discriminated against by the Waste Collection Authority having specified a system, a waste collection system that periodically obstructs the footway in a way that she's not able to cope. Um, there are alternatives. There are underground cassette systems, and that's uh, as installed in Edinburgh. Or there are pneumatic systems, which, again, require an organized underworld. Um, there's water recycling, um, much in vogue in California now. Um, you might see a, yet another edition of uh, utility pipes with these sort of mauve color things. Um, District heating, and there are district heating pipes being uh, marketed over there. If you're interested after the show, go over there and buy them. Uh, and you can have your own private district heating system in your street. But again, these are big pipes. They're inflexible. They're difficult to route through. They need space. They need to be designed in. They need to be worked into an, in, an under, underground environment that has been designed, not one that's chaotic. The trees, Trees in Design Action Group, uh, trees in hard landscapes, guide for delivery. Use this as a reference book if you want to plant trees. It's got information about uh, the uh, structured soils, Stockholm soils, uh, and a, a range of different planting techniques. Um, talking about infiltration, this is a, a storm in Bracknell in 2000. You've got 68 millimeters of rain, it's in the white, falling in the space of two hours. Uh, an intense summer th thunderstorm, we're going to get these more often as climate change comes on. We need these infiltration features in our streets or there are going to be significant pl flooding problems. Um, so these are lost opportunities. Road works free streets as well. Competition between utilities. If the if the surfaces below streets are already full, filled up, it's really difficult for an additional utility company to come in and put in their infrastructure. So lastly, a risk to life. Utility strikes. There are, I think, over 10,000 of these in the UK each year. Um, and this is an example I picked off YouTube this morning. Um, somebody drilling into an 11,000 volt cable, um, a huge flash, 
<clears throat> about two seconds later, the sparks are dropping. You can should be able to see a smoke. These lap chaps emerging, and he's falling backwards or uh, tumbling over heel. What happened? Ninety thousand pound fine for the contractor. Um, negligence, CDM stuff, health and safety at work. But <clears throat> what we're talking about is a systemic problem. It's not just the contractor that is responsible for this. This is a societal issue. It's government that permits this chaos to obtain in our streets. I think it's negligent. Um, there are massive opportunities being lost. Only central government can do something about this. We need a change in the legislation. We need great awareness of the different technologies that can be applied to mapping the underworld, designing the underworld, and the different technologies that can be used to help infiltration, plant trees, and utilize all the opportunities for things like district heating that will help address the future challenges that we face in this century. That's me. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to give you a very quick trot through a lot of things of how you get a lot of people together from different professions and different things to come to a common aid that's going to actually work. My challenge started with TRL. They did some work which an analysed what a modern motor car would do in the street. So therefore, that evidence, this document, Manual for Streets. But of course, being Scots, we have to do things slightly different. We put a kilt on it and called it Designing Streets. Designing Streets is government policy. That is a fundamental difference. The problem, of course, was that all the local authorities in Scotland, their guidance to developers as to how to get a road adopted and designed didn't comply with this. My suggestion was that we got all the local authorities in Scotland together, we'll do one documentation and that will be better. It's cost effective for us to deliver it that way and it's better for the development industry because they then understand what it is they're going to go to. I'll give you a bit of advice when you're talking to a lot of different people in different sectors, there comes a point when you've got to say stop talking, actually go on with doing something. We created this, it took us two, uh, four years to actually create this. Um, and as you can see there, it's fairly straightforward. It's uh, built on the net, so it's free for everybody to use. Uh, because it's built on the net, then we can put hyperlinks into it for all the detailed conversations and best practice and legislation that's required. I've talked to you about the best national approach, so the developers all know what it is. The vast majority of local authorities in Scotland have now got this as their policy. It's gone through their committee process. But not everything's the same. We've addressed placemaking. So we've got local variations in there and you access that by a little hy hyperlink on a map within it and it actually allows you to go to that particular area. It took us four years to do this. We don't want to do that again. We've got a review group within it. It allows it to actually monitor what happens as time goes by and we can upgrade it. It's actually um, reviewed every year. And that's a hyperlink at the bottom if you want to actually get it, but it's easier just to Google Scott's National Roads Development Guide. That will take you to it. So that's my job done. I'm quite happy. Problem, of course, is that's not what actually happened. When we had discussions with some of the other industry uh, sectors, we realised that many of the people were cherry-picking stuff out of the document. It's 200 pages big, this, this document. So a lot of stuff is every particular sector that you will get involved in in a street. <coughs> and because a vast majority of the people who are designing it are not civil engineers, we have a problem. They've got a lack of confidence. And this little formula I've got at the bottom is the lack of confidence actually has major impacts on it. As you can see, the lack of confidence is the resistance to change. You don't understand it. And if you've got a resistance to change, then you've not got any benefit of what you were trying to do in the first place. I think the next stage is that I can talk about the number of different professions, private and public sectors that I dealt with. So I spoke with all the planning um, authorities in Scotland, also talked to Construction Scotland, uh, who do the detailed um, delivery of components. Homes for Scotland are the representative body of the developers in Scotland, and of course, Scottish government. And we realized we've got a huge gap in our knowledge. No one actually trains everybody to do street design. It's make it up, do it yourself, bit by bit. 
The key, of course, was we're trying to do something to get it right first time, to save time. Bear in mind, this document links to the planning process and it's a key PI that actually causes a problem. Homes for Scotland said to us that they wanted to know that their developers, when they're, or their members, when they were appointing their consultants, that they were qualified in doing this work. So therefore they insisted that it had to be, uh, I've forgotten the word now, you've got to get a qualification, okay, um, to, to do this work. So as soon as we started that, I went on to speaking to universities, this is Strathclyde who do that type of work, and during the conversation it became quite important that the key issues were time out of the office. So distance learning was going to be the key way of delivering this, which is actually easier. The minute you start talking distance learning, it means that if you change some of the legislation, one or two bits and pieces, it becomes a transferable project. Some of my colleagues all around the world are getting quite interested in this. So my job then was to go and do the business plan, see what would happen, and the business plan started to bring things in that were totally different, unforeseen. The idea was if you're going to do a street design academy, then you're going to have to have a group that reviews this, a management group. That's made up of component parts of the industry. For the first time ever, we're going to have a peer review group. They can actually look at some of the stuff that's actually asking you what you want to do in streets. You'll be shocked to realise that much of the guidance that comes from government sectors don't necessarily fit with other guidance. And it's a bit of a problem. More than that, we can get a, a students into it for their dissertation so we can get research development, focus on what they want to do and get it back into the industry rapidly. And the final point there, one of the more important points is that the people who are actually doing this, when they change, we've got access into their graduates, we can actually exert change instantly because having our access to the graduates means that that happens. But we've overlooked something. Robert's been going on about it. We live in the same world. I'm going to give you a little break from me banging on and listen to a little film for three minutes and see what you think of actually a street. What it means to you.
you know, all around the world, doesn't matter where you go, we've got the same chaos that's going on. Streets have got a function for people and it's influenced very much by what goes on underneath the maintenance of our underground apparatus. I think we have to do something about it. I want you to take you into the underground world, just think about this, because one thing that's actually important for you to understand, this underground world is getting more and more congested. There is no overall management of it at all. Let me make that fundamentally clear. We've got the New Roads and Street Works Act 1991, it talks about coordination. 1991 in the UK was a different world entirely. I was fortunate enough in Scotland to actually be part of the team that put together the vault. Now that meant that we spoke to all the utility companies and we got all their data and put it together with an Ordnance Survey master map so now you can see it in two dimensions for the very first time. But it's not enough. We need to go further. We need to go to the three dimensional stage. We've got a requirement now for BIM. Level 2 is the requirement for all major government projects and Level 3 is going to come. Asset management is a fundamental part of it. They keep talking about local government not having any money. It's true. They have absolutely no chance of, of spending money on it. So they've got to sweat their assets to get the maximum lifespan out of their assets. I spent most of my career actually building roads. So I look at the science and the technology that was involved in actually building roads and the, and the compaction to get maximum life out of that road. So when someone tells me that putting a track through it and someone coming along a little whacker plate is going to actually maintain that lifespan, Sorry, I don't agree. And the National Roads Development Guide, well, we fixed an awful lot of problems that were actually there when we did it. I don't have time to go into the details, but one of the issues is we advocated the use of ducting. Now, ducting's got advantages and disadvantages. The advantages are fairly straightforward. You don't have to dig up the road when you want to replace them. You don't have to dig up the road when you can change them and upgrade them. First, you can do it faster than normal and you remove all the financial risk from the companies that are involved in it. So, but more than that, we can actually start, instead of having this level chaos, you can see the injured guidance there of what's supposed to happen. It's all at a level in the roads. We can start to get deeper, so we can use the space more efficiently. And of course, we build in contingency. So if anything comes along in the future, we've got the ability to do that as well. And when we talk about street trees, Underground management, I don't mean just utilities. I'm talking about sud cells that are underneath the ground. I'm talking about culverts. I'm talking about anything that happens to be there in London. You've got tube stations and we've got um, bridges and such like. But there's disadvantages. And I'm not going to be the first to actually say that getting the services out of the ducts into the buildings beside is where the concern is. We haven't really done the work. This is a sketch that was done on our um, report we did a number of years ago which had a concept of what the duct would look like at every junction. We haven't done it and some of the issues that we did come up with were things like access for operatives to get into this. Also there was security and there was, in the case of water, there had to be insulation. Actually in Scotland it can get quite cold at times up there and it freezes at depth. But one of the other big issues was middle management buy-in. You'd be surprised to know a lot of utility companies don't like working with one another. They don't like electricity to be in the same place as gas or water. Sorry, I've got news for you. You've been doing it for years. So here's the final part I'm getting to just now. If you want to get an integrated part, if you're really trying to get people of different professions and different things together, here's what it's all about. Sell it something that's in for them. What is the vested interest for these companies? Do they save money? Do they save hassle? Do they save time? A lot of them are quite pleased just to get rid of the stress. Common language. Work that I'm doing with my colleagues abroad, we're dealing with asset management. You'd be surprised, I'm not talking about a common language like you trying to understand my Scots accent. I'm actually talking about where financial and engineers try to speak together and they use technical detail information. It doesn't work together. But when they actually do click, when you do actually start to understand what it is that they're saying to one another, that's a real eureka moment and we get real developments when that happens. Communicate a vision, sell it for what it's supposed to be. And of course in my case it always helps when you've got a government requirement. If you've got a government requirement that makes it a real motivation to, to try and change things. And let's be honest about it, if you've got precedence that helps.
Let me introduce you to our presidents. 2015, my colleagues in New Zealand introduced the Utilities Access Act. This is the very first piece of legislation anywhere in the world that provides underground management. It's positive. The management is given to the local authority and they have to appoint a corridor manager. Now, it's not adversarial. They actually just discuss where they're going to put things in. But more than what happens here is when something's redundant, they talk about it coming out. I'm just going to paraphrase what the New Zealanders say to me. You know, it used to be chaos. Now it's tremendous. We'll let that stand in its own right. And I'll go back to the Street Design Academy that I've been talking about. We're not going to design streets just as you see them on the veneer on the surface. That will be a three-dimensional process. It's important that not just a bit of information is understood here, that all the information is understood so that we can do things better in the future. And ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much. That's me done. I hope you learned something on that. Well, thank you very much, John. Um, do people buy into the idea of um, the New Zealand approach? What do you reckon? Do we need a legislative change? Do I hear? Yep, there's some nods. Any dissenters? No. Jolly good. Well, look, thank you very much. I, I, I think it's good to see a practical way forward. So we, we've got, got ducks, we've got a change in the legislation, and we've got an understanding that these problems exist the world over. Anyway, next, Suzanne Scobie. Suzanne is a chartered engineer, former chair of the ICE's Southeastern Association, and she's got some practical experience um, working in a, one of our more innovative uh, new developments on the north, northwestern side of Cambridge, where she's been providing infrastructure advice. So I think you're going to show us some visualizations and fly-throughs as well with all of the advanced technology that ACOM has to offer. Over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to share with you my experience of developing a successful infrastructure design based on some case studies from the work we've undertaken to support phase one of the Northwest Cambridge development. The University of Cambridge is one of the world's leading universities. To maintain its reputation as a world leader, it needs to continue to develop and grow and address the issues of a lack of affordable accommodation for its staff and students and the need to encourage research and development. So it decided in 2005 to start a master planning process to plan for its future residential and research requirements on land to the northwest of the city. Outline planning consent was granted in 2013 for a mixed-use development incorporating housing, academic research and development space and various community facilities and a series of reserve matters applications were approved between then and 2015. Construction has now started and the primary school opened in September last year. Today I'm an employee of ACOM, although I initially became involved in this project when Scott Wilson were appointed to provide multidisciplinary engineering support to the university. At the time I joined the project team, ACOM were already providing master planning, sustainability, landscape and town planning support to the university. Of the various engineering roles that my team have provided as Scott Wilson, URS, and more recently ACOM, we keep being taken over, next year will be something else. Um, it is the work we undertook on the infrastructure design of the underworld, which my presentation relates to. So I joined the project team in 2010 and became the project manager for the infrastructure design. My team provided engineering input to the development of the master plan and supported the outline planning application. We developed the site-wide design for the roads, utilities and drainage across phase one and for many of the actual development parcels within phase one. Part of my role also included the coordination of our designs with the university's multidisciplinary project team. The university wanted its development to be delivered to the highest environmental standards, incorporating best practice in environmental sustainability. They required that it would be built to be an exemplar of sustainable living, able to um, accommodate the impacts of climate change. As designers, we were challenged to consider the future requirements of the development in relation to surface water management, consumption of potable water in order to, to secure credits for BRIAM Excellent and Code for Sustainable Homes Level 5. As the land was previously greenbelt, we had additional challenges from the Area Action Plan to reduce flood risk downstream. 
We also needed to give consideration to the management of materials that arose from the construction processes, the site-wide generation of heat and hot water, the use and generation of electricity, and the management of refuse that would be um, generated by the people living on the site. The university's brief was for a high quality landscape. We needed to develop a master plan with consideration for landscape, ecology, and the environment and engineering. To do this, we needed to understand the existing drainage regime and the flooding mechanisms at the site. We went on to include allowances in the master plan for surface water and attenuation in open features and worked with the master planners to orientate blocks to work with topography and consider exceedance flows. With the landscape team, we were able to incorporate cascading suds to provide treatment trains and restrict the discharge leaving the development and long-term storage to avoid an increase in the volume of the water that would otherwise leave the development. The university's vision was to create a new urban extension to the city. The master plan evolved through engagement with local stakeholders and was updated to address feedback from the area action plan and various workshops of stakeholders. One of the changes was to introduce landscape threads running through the site into the western edge. So various different swales and green fingers that came through to connect to the corridor next to the M11. These threads would function as suds corridors providing areas for ecological habitats, biodiversity, and space for recreation and play. A common theme of the master plan was to provide a landscape and amenity corridor next to the M11. So as we came to develop the Western Edge proposals, we had various ecological engineering constraints to which had to be informed as we took it forwards. There's an existing brook that we couldn't relocate because it had a legal status we needed to include a maintenance zone along the corridor of that watercourse and contain flood water within the site and not let it surcharge back under the M11. We had to maintain some existing trees, not alter the easement that related to the high pressure gas main, accommodate arisings that came from the construction development process and store additional water. So collectively we worked with the ecologists and the landscape team to respond to the area action plan, reduce flood risk and create a two-stage channel along the corridor of the watercourse to increase its capacity and enable its maintenance strip to be retained and to create a new relief channel to receive flows from the attenuation lagoons and to provide additional storage for that as well. And the benefit of including the buns was we were able to provide some um, visual and acoustic screening of the motorway for parts of the development. So the master plan that went forward into the planning application incorporated swales adjacent to the main streets, ponds for attenuation and landscape buns and a relief channel in the western edge. So to support the planning application, we prepared a series of deliverables. And once planning consent was granted, we took forward the design in further detail um, by assisting in the discharge of several planning conditions. And two of the strategies I'll, I'll pick on here because they relate to the design of the underworld are the surface water drainage strategy and the potable water supply strategy. So as is common, the surface water drainage strategy defines the runoff from each plot into the eight drainage networks we had at the site. The characteristics of each plot were considered. Runoff from the impermeable areas was assigned to the network so we could size the swales and the drainage network. But it also identified the attenuation volumes required on each plot and gave ideas for how the attenuation could be delivered and which ones were the most suitable. The strategy also went on to identify the volume of storage required in the lagoons adjacent to the western edge. This document was a useful one. It referred back to the flood risk assessment but set the scene for all of the work that would then take place with the architects that came forward as the development rolls, rolls, goes ahead in the next 20 years. The east of England has one of the lowest rainfalls in the country and it is actually classified as being semi-arid. The area action plan required that the development incorporated water conservation measures to reduce potable water consumption. And in order to meet Code for Sustainable Homes Level 5, we needed to reduce the daily potable use of water to 80 litres per head per day. Looking at the Code for Sustainable Homes water calculator, we were able to identify the uses that could be actually accommodated from potable or non-potable uses. And actually the non-potable uses could provide one third of a person's daily use for flushing toilets, using washing machines and irrigating gardens. 
the university's team reviewed a series of options to reduce water use, including grey water recycling, surface water recycling, a combination of the two, and in addition to the use of water saving devices. The university chose to use a site-wide rainwater recycling facility. And this image illustrates how the process would work. So rainfall would fall onto each plot shown by the group of houses. It would pass through the suds and swales, be intercepted prior to discharge into the watercourse, and go to a pumping station where it would then be treated and returned across the site in a pipe, another pipe network of non-potable water. And then waste from the various plot properties would then pass out through the found drainage system. This process ensured that every property connected, built at the site would be connected to the potable supply and the non-potable water supply across the site and satisfy the credits for Code and Briam. So we went on to design the detailed landscape and engineering for the highway corridors and the western edge. And within phase one itself, we were also supporting more than 10 architects um, as the university brought forward a series of development parcels to promote the integration of attenuation within the landscape to develop water sensitive urban design solutions. We considered maintenance aspects in the selection of drainage features, ensured the site wide levels and plot levels were designed to consider exceedance and coordinated underground drainage and utilities with the on plot landscaping and tree provision. I've included some examples of the suds that we used across phase one to provide parts of the treatment train and to restrict discharge from each of the plots. We used swales both on the plots and in the larger green fingers to hold water in significant rain. Um, they were used, yeah, sorry, moving on, sorry. We also had controlled surface flooding on various plots. This was designing the landscape to actually create and control flooding and known events and then consider exceedance beyond that point. And at some places they could become landscape features. We also had a clever use of rills in some of the denser plots. Um, and we had, in addition to that, blue roofs on top of Sainsbury's, one of the big supermarkets, huge roof space. We were able to put a blue roof in there. We had green roofs on top of even substations and all sorts of other structures, cycle stores, there were all sorts of innovative solutions that were considered, um, and also brown roofs. So every building had photovoltaics, but we could still incorporate brown roofs and consideration was given to how we could att um, provide attenuation there. And lastly, we did have crates, but it was the last of our selection hierarchy. Through an integrated design approach with the on-plot landscaping architects, we were able to successfully develop designs which delivered the university's requirements for plot density, surface water management and a high quality landscape. So this is one of the main streets through the development. It's quite complicated. We had to give quite a lot of consideration to this corridor. It needed to provide sufficient space for the road, for the traffic, for the pedestrians and cyclists, landscaping, trees, swales, parking areas, we have an underground refuse collection system, so that had to be accommodated as well, um, and then the various different utilities. The main street through the site was then going to be adopted by the County Council, so we had to carefully locate the services that were public and private separately, so we could still get the corridor adopted. And we had to demonstrate through the planning process to the local planning authority that the designs for the underworld were coordinated and included adequate provision for the trees, the swales, all the underground utilities and the bins. So this is one of the green fingers through the site. It's one of the largest ones that we had. And it provided a significant amount of online attenuation storage in addition to conveyance and treatment. So back, back to the western edge and the, the comment previously about surface water recycling. Um, there were two, two key swales that came into this, this one here at the bottom and the one from the right hand side, which is from the image I just showed you. That surface water discharges through a reed bed into the main part of the lagoon. From that, surface water is extracted into the grey box where it was treated and then returned around the site as non-possible water. Cambridge Water, who are the water authority in the area, they became very engaged in the process and they've taken the, the design forward and they've designed and adopting the treatment plant and they will also adopt the, non, the on-site non-potable water network. And taking it through sort of in, in cross-section to provide an example, we've got the M11 over here, then we've got the original water course, and then so we've had to maintain the gas easement with footpaths on top of it, relief channels, then we have a bund, and then through to the lagoon, and then the development on the right. And, and within that, we have some engineering to support it. 
which includes complex controls to actually ma you know, manage the water flow from the site at various storm events. So the underground network of infrastructure is, is really quite compli complex at this site. So we have standard utilities, which every development has, but we also have a district heating network, which, as Robert mentioned earlier, big pipes, rigid, quite inflexible. Um, we then had the non-potable water network, which we had to keep in private corridors where possible, the university's own communications network, and then a series of underground bins, um, which we have a bespoke ref refuse vehicle that we had to allow for and consider in vehicle movements. So to take that forward and prove that we could sort of the, co the corridor could accommodate the swales, we chose to model the various items in 3D. And this is a 2D extract from the model, which we prepared to accompany one of the reserve matters applications to demonstrate to the planning authority how the underworld was coordinated. So within this series of utility lines, but we've got some, some laybys and parking areas, and those are grey boxes towards the top of the underground bins. So we had needed to prove that all the utilities could pass these without actually being obstructed. Now, if technology works, yay, excellent. So this is um, a fly through through our 3D model. This was a design tool that we sort of used and actually it helped us to show to the client, to all the different uh, consultants we were working alongside, how the designs were coordinated and working, where we identified problems and how we could overcome them. So brown, foul drainage, blue surface water, but you can sort of see some depressions in here which relate to the swales. Uh, we then had connections through to all the on-plot networks. There's a further swell across to the right hand side. And then um, with sort of the images we got from the architects, we could then actually start looking at the scale of this and looking at where all their plant rooms were and how we could coordinate their services with the site-wide network. So as the model goes forward, you can see one of the key swales there that leads to the lagoon at the top. And then that's the lagoon I was just talking about previously, where the swales come through. So we used micro drainage to, to model the drainage, but then Civils 3D to bring these together and coordinate them all. We went on, and I'll, I'll come back to lot five in a minute, but you can see all the various piles in the structure. Some of these were taken a bit further again, just to actually test the design principles that we were applying. But again, through here, we've got swales, and then some of the laybys that are shown are for the bin collection. So within this, we, we work with um, Anglian Water on the foul network, and Cambridge Water on the, on the potable to make sure we, we took account of their designs for incoming services to the site, it's Greenfield, it needed, needed some external supplies to come in, as well as coordinating with sort of UKPN and substation locations, the HV network, the LV network, and the district heating grid. And one of the things we located was the energy center, which is, that's a gray box there, in order that the district heating main could run through the footway cycleway corridors and outside the main road infrastructure. And actually sort of again, look at that sort of coordination of key routes. But in terms of that design process, it was identifying the key constraints first and designing around it. So much easier to design from the start, the district heating and the drainage, and then add in the ducts and things that don't rely on gravity connections. So this is an example from, from lot five where the university ran a BIM trial. So as part of this process, we modeled in 3D every rainwater pipe, um, which is all the sort of downpipes in blue leading to the on plot sort of attenuation that you can see there and every, every SVP in, in brown to go to the foul network. And we also modeled the um, incoming utilities and took them to the plant room connections. And as part of this process, we actually were able to sort of resolve and eradic eradicate a huge number of clashes and problems prior to the scheme ever going on site and being built. And we're actually now utilizing these skills on more projects for other clients where we're in a dense urban environments in London and we're using GPR surveys to find the utilities and then to build in the drainage designs and we're moving a river. So all these things are all part of that process as we develop the designs now. So it isn't just for greenfields, you can do this in, in brownfield development too. So we went on to support the university in the construction phase. And, and because of that knowledge that we had of the water management, we were involved in preparing the construction environmental management plan, the pollution control strategy, and sort of ensuring that pollution and contaminants uh, were intercepted and didn't reach the brook, the groundwater, or the suds networks. Um, we prepared designs for haul roads incorporating swales and pollution control lagoons. And then as the designs were tendered um, as design and build, we retained an, a role for the client 
on a design assurance side, reviewing their designs to ensure they're compliant with the work we had done to date. So this photograph was taken um, some time ago from site. There's actually up-to-date drone footage on the university's website if you want to sort of see the cranes in action and the buildings um, reaching their full scale. But part of the early works that the university did is, was, was to actually build the buns and the western edge to ensure they had the lagoon to hold the water ready for its use when the first people come to site and actually start using that non-potable network. The um, circular building is the primary school, first you know, university primary school, um, which opened its doors in September. Um, and so there's various other, other sort of at the cricket pitch that's being formed. But it's, it's really quite insane. The, the drones are actually amazing, going back in real civil engineering. You can sort of see the whole thing going on. Um, but it's, it's sort of the, everything we've put in for the beginning and the outset has been sort of taken forward into the design process. So what are we doing now? Um, as part of their commitment to achieving BRIAM excellent, the university has asked us to review the various strategies we've produced to date. So, and so we're going to support them by revisiting the water supply strategy, the flood risk assessment, the drainage strategy, looking at the impacts of the changes in climate change policy, and actually sort of seeing if the strategies are being delivered as they were intended, or whether there's any lessons we have to learn from phase one to roll out to the future phases of the development. So what messages can we take away from this project? We've identified that sort of one solution can have multiple benefits, whether that's designing in 3D, whether that's looking at a gas easement and buns and watercourses and trees and finding a solution in the western edge that actually creates a habitat and amenity. Um, we've looked at sort of how other, other bits of sustainable and green solutions can actually provide all sorts of benefits and may actually be cheaper to build and maintain and more accessible than the traditional sort of um, engineering solutions and, and bring benefits with them. Rainwater is a true resource that, you know, given what you were saying about that storm event, you know, there's lots of water that lands, capture it, reusing it where we can. Um, and we're proud to have been involved in such a project, landmark project, and we're now sharing some of this best practice with um, other clients of ours. And here is an image I'd like to leave you with. This shows part of the landscaped area running alongside the motorway, provides a wildlife corridor, pedestrian and cycle links, and a landscape setting. This will create a community amenity, but also providing a resource of rainwater for reuse. And it demonstrates how the successful delivery of designs can be achieved when development proposals consider and integrate drainage and utility provision at the early planning stages of a project. At the beginning of my presentation, I mentioned the university's vision for development. They wanted it to be built to the highest environmental standards, incorporating best practice and sustainability. And this image hopefully shows how the university's brief for a quality landscape can be delivered if you consider landscape ecology and engineering from an early point in the planning process and you can successfully achieve outcomes like these. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Suzanne. Um, it's often that you hear somebody calling a scheme of uh, outstanding environmental quality and sustainability, and it isn't. Um, in fact, I think that's generally the case. But... I think that's probably one of the first schemes that I've seen where that description genuinely applies. And I will be personally looking forward to going and visiting it in the future. And I think the approach to uh, mapping in 3D the underworld is something that I hope we'll start to see across the country in practice.